Um, let me introduce our speakers. It's my pleasure to welcome Alexia Cardona, who uh, leads training development at the University of Cambridge Bioinformatics Training Program. She's also the leader for training and capacity building in Elixir Converge project, which is an international project to build uh, and establish very high quality data education, as well as an instructor and maintainer for the Carpentries, um, an international community um, that runs courses on coding and data management. Uh, we also have with us Florian Markowitz, who is senior group leader at the Cancer Research UK Cambridge Institute. Uh, his research employs both uh, computational and experimental approaches to better understand cancer. And he has won several awards and prizes for it, including the Royal Society Wolfson Research Merit Award and Cancer Research UK Future Leader in Cancer Research um, Prize. Uh, we have Leonard Soy, who is project manager at the Research and Innovation Unit of the European Universities Association. He works on uh, EU policy including, among other, open research and open research infrastructure, including um, the uh, European Open Science Cloud. And he's a work package leader in the FAIRS FAIR project, focusing specifically on research data management skills uh, within university curricula. And uh, we have Renee Schneider, a professor for information science at the Geneva School of Business Administration, having previously worked in the automotive industry, um, alongside his teaching and management, um, René works on research projects concerning open science, research data, and the uh, usability and usefulness of research information system. So uh, thanks to you all for being here today. Today's session uh, came about when we started to think about Cambridge Data Week and what topics we wanted to cover, um, partly because we were really interested in this idea of reproducibility having had several discussions at Cambridge about who uh, should be responsible for reproducibility initiatives, which team or teams uh, should own such initiatives at Cambridge, um, but also perhaps from a sense within our team, and we've always been about research data management, that um, reproducibility has come about in the last few years and sort of stolen the show a little bit. <laughs> I don't know if there's a little bit of tongue in cheek there, but uh, we did have this sense that um, reproducibility and data management certainly interact in a lot of ways, and we wanted to understand that a little bit better. And um, so we'll start hearing from our speakers about this question that introduces the theme from today. And then um, we'll have questions from you and a few questions that have been sent ahead. So please use the chat at any point um, to write down questions that I can ask. So. Let's start with, is research data man management now just a footnote to reproducibility? Should we just focus our attention on advocating for reproducibility and talking about good data management as one of the practices that enables reproducibility? Um, Alexia, can we start with you? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Bea, and thank you for the nice introductions as well. Um, indeed, um, reproducibility and data management are two terms kind of that are being used interchangeably, um, uh, especially recently because of the large amounts of data that is being generated in, in certain areas. I have I prepared a few slides to start introducing this topic, maybe even to instigate a few discussions as well when we open up the floor. I just need to share my screen if you just bear with me a moment. Yes, thank you very much. Are you okay, able to perfect. see it? Brilliant. So yeah, this is so this is basically the data uh, life cycle. It's it's from the UK Data Service. It's a popular resource that uh, people when we talk about data management, uh, most of us kind of immediately associate it. Uh, to the data life cycle and and because it involves the management of data in the different stages um, and that's exactly what the slide is showing so it's showing these different stages involved so when we talk about research data management we are talking about planning of the research collecting data processing and analyzing data publishing and sharing data preserving data and reusing data and all these are important 
you know, and all these are the different stages that we go through from start to end of the process, and it repeats itself. That's why it's a circle. Uh, now, reusability is not actually uh, a specific stage in this life cycle. However, it is implied um, in a way in each stage of the life cycle. And, and one item I would like to put forward, um, maybe even for discussion later, um, is that so far most of the effort on reproducibility has been on the actual data. Um, but I personally think it is also uh, important to also think about the methods and scripts um, that have been used to generate uh, the results of the data, because most of the time we see all the papers being published and the authors normally publish uh, the data set that is being used. And then, you know, when a researcher tries to replicate the same study, uh, they often find problems. That's where the problem starts because the scripts are not published, so they find it very hard to try to rewrite all the steps uh, provided only with the methods description, which is most of the time limited because of journal restrictions. So this is one of the things that I think we should think about. And hopefully this also brings into light the, the difference uh, between data management and reproducibility. Another interesting thing, and I'm pretty sure most of you have seen this already, um, uh, reproducibility crisis. Um, uh, so I think uh, this nature paper, this was a nature paper in 2016, and I think it was uh, one of the agents that triggered uh, the reproducibility crisis topic. Um, and it brought in a way more light into the severity of the situation. The survey um, surveyed uh, uh, about 1,500 researchers and 70% uh, of these uh, failed to reproduce another scientist experiment. And 50% of the researchers failed to reproduce their own experiments, which is hilarious, <laughs> but it's the reality. Um, uh, um, uh, and in most of the cases, I do feel this is because uh, the data is not being annotated or curated properly, and the scripts used uh, to process the data are not published. Um, and also because of, of the nature of the whole project. So most of the time as researchers, we are pushed to publish the data as quickly as possible because there are other competition from other groups or universities. So the focus is on publishing the paper and not actually how to do it the right way. Um, and I think then again, the, the whole idea of research, uh, data management and reproducibility here also comes um, into play. Um, one last thing, I am, uh, as you mentioned, my, my work at the university is mainly now focused on training. I deal with uh, training development and capacity building, um, and not just at the university, also in the international organization, Elixir. And uh, my colleagues published this year a very um, important paper that was already um, uh, shared around. Um, it was about 10 simple rules uh, for making training materials fair. And uh, this is also important because many of the lectures do not publish openly their, their materials. And this, of course, leads uh, to the slowness, you know, and um, the, the, if there is no training available, uh, readily available, it, it will be slow and it will not help to meet the demand uh, when there is high demand. And that is what um, Elixir, uh, this organization that I also work uh, heavily with, we're trying to tackle. We're, uh, we're specifically targeting data management training um, uh, together with my colleagues, Celia from the Netherlands, Patricia from Switzerland, Brane from Slovenia and Pascal from the Elixir Hub. Um, we, we are co-leading this project on training where we aim to provide uh, training specifically in data management to help target um, this gap and create more awareness uh, into the field. I think um, I will stop here and hopefully we can continue the discussion later on. Thank you very much, Alexia. Lots of very interesting prompts to start with. Um, Florian, can we come to you next? Sure. 
Hi, I'm Florian. I can give you more like a, an applied researcher perspective on this. So for me, research data management and reproducibility are just different facets of doing good science. You're always doing good science and how we deal with code and data and how we make them accessible to other people and how we are open to their feedback as part of that. So personally, I'm, I'm not so super interested in which words we use and how we call this, this, this process. The major difference I see between different terms is often how easily they can be used to excite people. And then the issue with research data management is, and I don't want to offense to anybody working in this field, but it, it, it's, it sounds a bit dry, doesn't it? it? Sounds a bit dry and technical. And so the major advantage I see of using the word reproducibility is it's just an easier way into open science and to promote an open science culture, because it's pretty easy to see that science which is not reproducible is also not successful. And I think there is still a very big need to get more and different people involved in open science and to get them excited about open science. Uh, in my experience, the young people, the, the ECRs, the early career researchers, they're pretty much sold on the idea. They're very excited. They're very open to it. Uh, tick mark, done. The problem is if we actually want to have wider ranging impact, we need to talk, talk to the old people. We need to target the higher ups. And we have to make sure that on top of the grassroots movement, we also have support from the top down. Because honestly, fish think from the head. So we need to target heads of school. We need to target department heads. That's the kind, that's the level of people that we need to push an open science agenda. The grassroots are good, but it's even better if we have explicit and very robust support from the top. And that is an idea. You see, this is where I think then talking about reproducibility rather than data management is somehow easy. I think it's much more accessible to them. Uh, none of these people think of themselves as managers. They think of themselves as leaders. So what you could do is you could call it research data leadership. And I think it would have a much better appeal already. Uh, but you see, the idea that we need to target people at the top is getting more and more traction. I was just reading this paper on the psychology archive, Psy Archive by Ulya Kowalczyk about how senior academics can support reproducibility. And they have like a, a three-step guide. And just to be explicit what, 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 why the senior people are important is, uh, step one is we need to change how we hire. And that is exactly what senior people do and not junior people. So for example, a very simple step to just really push open science much, much further would be to including open science commitments into a job ads as necessary requirements. So then no matter what we call it, research data management or reproducibility, it will be very central as soon as everybody knows if you want a job in Cambridge, you have to show evidence of a very strong track record in these open science practices. Um, so if I think again about the initial the question about how these two terms relate to each other, for me personally, it's less important uh, what we call it. It's really much more important that we get people excited and we get more and more senior people uh, on board. And this is why I personally usually talk more about reproducibility. I just find it easier to use this term to excite people. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much. And again, lots of interesting ideas and a clear message there. Thank you. Um, Leonard, could you um, speak to us about this? Sorry, we can't hear you. Perhaps somebody needs to unmute Leonard. Sasha, thank you. Uh, thank you. Apparently, uh, I could not unmute myself for a second there. So thank you for, for helping out with that. And yeah, thank you for, for, for inviting me to this really interesting discussion. And it's, uh, it will be hard to say, I, th I guess, to have a lot of disagreement among the speakers here, but uh, I would like to chip in uh, from what Florian just said and to take it a little bit forward that, that there is a very big, I think, overlap between the ideas behind reproducibility or and the, the, the kind of the yardstick of reproducibility as a quality measure and the practice of research data management as something that enables that in, in many fields of research. But yeah, I think they are related, but not necessarily the same. And I would just like to focus on a few points why 
research data management is also a topic now, for example, for funders, for um, at the European level, from the policy field that we see, but also um, how it feeds into different aspects of a researcher's life that some of them are, to, to use the, to borrow the term, uh, more excitable maybe for individual researchers and some others are less. And that's why I think we need to, to look at those in a correlation, but not uh, as, the, as exactly the same thing, at least um, when we think about it, maybe when we really communicate, there can be a different focus. So one thing why we do research data management and why it's it's being done much more and it's expected one once more, of course, it's what, what has been said to uh, to solve this uh, reproducibility crisis or as one measure to solve this reproducibility crisis where we found that um, way too many uh, papers and studies can just not be reproduced and therefore the, the quality and the validity of the, their findings is just in question and that is that is not good and that is why research needs to find a mechanism to address this issue and this is where I think research data management is, is a major part of it. Um, so this is the first thing. Um, the another thing that just very much why, we, why research data management is now more and more important is simply to review results, not necessarily to reproduce them, but if you have a study that does not uh, offer access to data, you're, it makes, makes also the review and, the, and this type of quality assurance more difficult. And there were some very high level examples with COVID research this year that shocked many people where papers were, I think, retracted because the data was not uh, made available in the end. And these are, I think, two motivations that should be considered why research data management is, is important as the supporting the internal quality uh, and review mechanisms that, that the research system has um, already in place and to make them more, more robust in the end. Um, now, outside of these mechanisms, I think uh, the reuse of data, not for reproduction, but for merging it with other data sets from other researchers or for companies that would like to, to use results when the data is open and accessible, uh, is also an interesting, important um, aspect why research data management uh, should be done, because that is something that you need to plan from the beginning of the research data lifecycle, as, as uh, Alexia showed in, in the beginning. So this is also why some aspects that you need to consider like interoperability is important because if you don't start this in your research data management process from the start on, this, is, uh, this makes uh, the reuse in other sectors very difficult. And um, that's why RDM, I think there is important. Now, uh, also picking up again from something that Florian mentioned, uh, we, as EUA, we try to move forward in a, towards an academic system that uh, rewards more and diverse activities and, and outputs of research and different types of impact of, of, of research. So in the end, if you want to have a system that um, actually rewards not just individual, certain papers and certain journals, uh, but also data, software, and code of different notions of impact uh, that your research can have, then we need actually to have um, the practices such as research data management that actually enable this type of um, transition. And there's of, there's, of course, an interplay between these two, but I think this is also something to consider that if we, in the future, want a system that just does not look only at papers, but also the contributions of researchers that they make to data sets, to data collection and curation and all the other aspects there, then this is just something that needs to be done uh, systematically. And two, two more issues that I think relate more to the public accountability that are being used very much in the policy debate is simply that public funding is being used for the majority of at least academic research and there um, from funders is the expectation to, to treat the data in, a, in an accountable way to have this kind of duty of care to use the public money for a, in a certain way that is professional and that is also traceable and transparent and that is why data management plans to some to also in addition to the idea of better reproducibility are uh, becoming more and more uh, the norm and I would be surprised if there in a couple of years are any funders or research institutions that don't require DMPs uh, uh, for, for their research projects at different stages. And that relates to also to another point that is the legal handling of, of data that also relates to data management planning and to research data management processes. So using the data lifecycle to actually prepare your entire research project where it concerns uh, 
different legal questions of data collection or analysis is also important and i would count, count this as part of research data management and i think uh, in this there's of course a lot of debate about the fair principles um those of findability accessibility interoperability and reusability and i think all of those enable different aspects of these these few points that i've just mentioned um the issue is i don't think either that they are very excitable to talk about fair data uh, or just about research data management so i think from those points that that I just made, you can kind of pick the ones that are most relevant for different actors or individual researchers and see what they um, resonate uh, with, uh, or resonate to with the best. So, for example, reproduction or just publishing your your papers with uh, with data that's needed for the review uh, alongside is something that uh, that should motivate many people uh, to do this. And this is definitely something that we would like to see more. Um, so. To, to kind of summarize this, uh, I think, yeah, reproducibility and, and data management are definitely some very much related issues. They're not necessarily the same, depending on the, the elements that you look at um, from, from the ways I've just pre presented it. And I think also, yeah, reproducibility is also a little bit, also has other issues um, that just research data management, so just the, the language that you use, it was, <laughs> it was also just mentioned, or software and code, so there can also be, the, there should be software management as well, or code management, and this is an open whole other related topic, but yeah, I, I would say there's a big overlap, but uh, let's not uh, completely uh, say that they're the same uh, issue. Thanks very much, Leonard, um, appreciate that, and again, you've touched on so many interesting points that we can pick up later. Um, and I think it was very timely that what you said aligned quite well with the comment that came up in the chat about aligning the outcomes and processes with values and, and considering the ethics as well, as well as touching on other issues. Um, okay, um, Renee, could you um, share your thoughts on this? Yes, uh, thank you for inviting me. And uh, I think in, we should consider first that in the short history of research data management, um, the, it was um, that the archivists that brought forward research data management. So, it's, so uh, we saw the research data life cycle at the beginning, and there are some other models where archiving and preservation is really in the center, which uh, is something that makes uh, researchers wonder when you present them the cycle. No, and later, some years later, I think there were lots of people from open access. Uh, that had an interest uh, in, in research data. And the, the data continuum model was created to, to um, create a link to, uh, between open access and research data management. So, um, and I think in the first phase, or during these first two, two, two phases, researchers were wondering what was happening to them. Uh, all of a sudden, these, these strange archivists come and, and ask them to uh, write the data management plan or to do other awkward things. And um, I think now researchers have realized the necessity of um, of research data management and are trying in a, maybe in a way of forward retaliation trying to get back some some space uh, and and are putting reproduce repu reproducibility forward i already i already had the problem when we were talking first with that word it's a horrible so word, you see i'm I, i'm also a researcher but i even can't pronounce the word reproducibility <laughs> okay so i think when i heard about this Reproduce, reproducibility and RDM as a footnote, I, uh, my first idea was to see them as two sides of the same coin. But I think research data management has all, always been, uh, has to be seen from the archival perspective and from the open access uh, perspective. And that brought me, uh, that made me create the slide that I want to share if I manage just Give me some seconds here, okay. So this is the slide that I just created because I like visual information. Uh, and I have to click here, now you see, I called it the sweet spot of research data management. Perfect. So you, you have archiving and preservation as an issue and you also have the open access and reproducibility and open science too, maybe either, I don't know, this could be a question that we discuss, is open science 
re more related to open access or more related to reproducibility? Or is open science the sweet spot of, in the center of the Venn diagram? No? And I think if these three come together, then things can work. But only at that time, uh, things can work. No? And I, I stopped the sharing screen. And I, have, I think I have some words to uh, say, but they are very general. Uh, what is important? So for me, archival issues are also the question about as long as, have data available as long as. Open access is about having data uh, available as soon as possible. And reproducibility is maybe more a question like having data as handy as or being the data as useful as. So I think these are the three aspects that come together. And, um, but we should never forget that in, in, in research data man management, the understanding, meaning and practice, practice differs from discipline to discipline. So it will be the same case uh, for reproducibility and especially between what we call natural sciences or hard sciences and the humanities. And it has always been difficult in research data management to find commons that can be shared by anyone, remaining as, gener as generic as possible in nature. A good example is the DMP. Now you can ask every scientist to create a DMP. So this is something that will differ in the, concerning the content, but not mainly in the structure. And um, so this is something very generic, but as soon as it comes to the data, it gets difficult. And I think for reproducibility, we have to find the same thing. We have to find something very generic. And from my personal point of view, and this is where I end, I think persistent identifiers and linked data will play an eminent and essential role, especially when they come together and when they are brought together. And I see a lot of uh, potential in bringing persistent identifier issues and linked data together to make data understandable and uh, reproducible and useful again. This is where mm -hmm. I end. Thank you very much, Renee. Uh, much appreciated. And again, so many good ideas. Um, and ending on this idea of identifiers where, you know, if people have some questions about that, then do put them in the chat. Um, I would like to follow up with uh, one question that's come through, which sort of links to a lot of what's been said in terms of good practice and what that means. Um, somebody talked about their work in the public statistical system uh, in 2000, where there were issues around data management and reproducibility. And they say the question was solved by the institution very quickly. They produced a code of good practice that everybody had to follow in the Institute. Collected data and programs are archived and accessible within the Institute. Why don't we have the same thing with publicly funded research? Why isn't there a code of good practice that all people need to follow? I guess that's a good question. Um, and I know some people are suggesting that there are some uh, codes and some indications. And we spoke about DMP templates. Um, but I suppose it's true that there isn't just a single code of good practice. And we haven't been able to solve it just by giving people a checklist. Um, and I guess that might relate to questions around disciplines which were brought up and, and how these things apply, especially in the arts, humanities and social sciences. Um, I wonder who, who would like to come in first on that. Perhaps Florian, I can see that you're there ready. Yeah, um, yeah I've been reading for some of the comments. Looks really, really interesting. Uh, some of the, the, the points people raised. The problem I have with the guidelines is, I think that's what the, where the discussion on uh, online is currently heading to, is nobody checks them. I mean, the stuff I could get away with, with my own publication, I wouldn't care about data sharing and open science. I mean, it's, it's nobody, I mean, if I don't check my lab, my students just do whatever they want. They just want their papers out. I mean, nobody else checks them. The reviewers, even when I'm a reviewer and I care a lot about this, how deep can I look into somebody else's code, which is very complex? Like, what do I do? I look for a link. I follow the link to the GitHub page and I, I just skim over it. If Is there some data? Is there some code? Looks good. Excellent. So there's a there's a problem with feedback. I mean, we have no mechanism. It's not clear. We should, I, 
honestly, maybe we shouldn't have it. I mean, there's so much reviewing we already do without being paid for it. Should I now review this even further? In that um, PLOS Computational Biology, where I'm on the editorial board, they have now um, a, a prototype service where if you submit, your paper will be reproduced by an indie or somebody tries to reproduce it. So somebody really puts the hours in to download the code and check if your whole thing is reproducible. I find this is amazing. That's exactly what I would like to see as a reader of a paper that it says, look, this is what your authors claim and an independent person can actually validate this. This is amazing, but how much does that cost? I mean, uh, yeah. I'm glad you raised that because actually the review of data is going to be the topic of Friday's session. So if right. anyone's interested, then right. we'll on Friday. This will be a short session because nobody's doing it. Yeah, no, that's a good point. We've spoken quite a bit about code. Alexia, did you want to come in on that? Yes, and in fact, I wanted to follow because I totally agree with what Florian said. Um, and it's 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 about the time, you know, it's it's what I mentioned in the beginning, the focus is to publish the papers because we live in a competitive world. Uh, many groups are doing very similar research and it's about who's going to publish it first to get the credit. So it's about this. And I think it's very hard to change this until there is a big effort done by the journals, the institutions, by the very uh, high up uh, hierarchy um, to tackle this. So it, it's, we are trying, there has been many uh, efforts to try this. There, there has been groups like RDA and Fair Sharing who are trying to develop policies as well and create more awareness. But the problem is, if the funding is not specific, there is no funding specific, for example, to say, okay, we're going to give you so much million pounds to create a guideline for data management or reproducibility, that's not going to happen. And then you have to, in a way, uh, you know, uh, push it uh, in academia and say, you know, to be able to publish your research, you have to follow this guideline that would involve hiring uh, a large amount of staff that would check then, like Floria mentioned, all the requirements check that the data, you know, like Floria said, you need someone to check if the data is really, you know, annotated properly, if it's clear what's, like it's a reviewer can do that. The reviewers are normally professors, people very uh, focused and very busy in their research, um, and they wouldn't be able to go deep into the actual data or code, they would read the paper and of course provide feedback on that, but not go into the tiny details of it. So I think to, to be able to tackle that, you need more money, you need to invest in having people. Um, one thing, for example, uh, that uh, the group I work with have been trying to push forward are data stewards. So these are people who do not work on the actual data but work around the data. So they will deal with ethics, you know, verification of data, et cetera. So you would need to hire people like that full time to be able to do all this work. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, until there is money to do this, I think uh, it's going to be hard uh, to achieve it, but there is a big effort. So I'm hopeful that slowly, slowly, the awareness is increasing and people slowly, slowly will take this more seriously. Thank you, Alexia. That's, that's a really good point. Leonard, from a policy perspective, is that something that's been explored? Do you recognize the same difficulties with checking that the guidelines <laughs> are being followed? Um, I, I think these are exactly the, the issues that we also need to think about at a policy level, because nothing uh, that is being done in terms of research data management comes for free. Uh, and you need to invest both, both as a funder, as uh, like at the European level, there's a lot of things being done such as uh, the European Open Science Cloud and the RDA is also partially supported by the EU for instance. Um, also at institutional level there needs to happen more in terms of uh, employing data support staff, data stewards or data curators or whatever terminology you use to, to um, call these different positions. But this takes time, this also needs to, you need to find the people who are actually interested in doing that job and to create like a career even in this, this field. So these are all things that take a lot of time to, um, to change. Um, my, my personal hope is, is I, I talked recently to, to some colleagues who were really following the, the Bologna process. 
and there they really talk about like this quality culture in education and i think that's that's really an interesting concept that we need to think about because they are it was like a top down sort of process at least that really institutionalized all these quality assurance mechanisms that you, you need to do when you give give courses uh, these days in terms of feedback and the assurance of these courses and that actually that probably was a big change at the european level but it was coordinated and now it's it's more or less accepted there are still people who criticize it but um, uh, at a big scale this is kind of accepted so i wonder why why is it why shouldn't it not be possible to make something like research data management an accepted practice in, in 10, 20 years that researchers or academics in this case just, just do as part of their daily job? And they need, of course, the institutional support um, to, to do this. It's probably a bit more complicated than, than for accrediting uh, courses, but still it's, it's possible to have this kind of systemic change within higher education institutions. So I. I think it's just to find out the best ways of doing that and discussions like like we're having today are just showing uh, the different kind of construction sites that we need to to uh, kind of serve in parallel to to arrive at a future that is a bit has at least more uh, data management practices as a, as a normal thing of research. Thank you. Yeah. And let's keep hoping and working in that direction. And Rene, was there anything from, from your perspective, from you know, librarian and archivist side of things that you wanted to add? Uh, maybe two things. First, um, as of the code of practice, I think this is something like trial and error. As with coding, you know, when you are programming, you always do trial and error. So we could propose something, but I, we, we, you can never be sure that it works. And then somebody mentioned uh, these new professions. And what we saw that now we have lots of professions that have the data prefix, like data librarian, data archivists, or even new uh, professions like data curators. And so we could see, is, is there something that specific that we need for reproducibility? For me, it could be something like data custodian or uh, something and and then work on on training programs to see uh, to to fill that gap that specific gap that helps us to make the data reproducible hmm. that's very interesting and actually i think that point may be picked up in tomorrow's session when we look at different models for supporting researchers um, to manage their data um i'm going to slightly change tack and now that we've thought about this idea of guidelines we started to look at kind of concrete practical ways people can um, do better data management and reproducibility. So this question came up and um, what in the context of RDM and reproducibility can be achieved without addressing the larger challenges in science, like the broken credit system, questionable publishing, the problems perhaps that we've mentioned about uh, reviewers not having time to check on data and so on. I wonder if we can think of concrete things that researchers, librarians, support staff can, can do that will have an impact um, while we try to fix the big systemic changes. Would anyone like to come in first on that? Florian. I mean, there is this picture of, of having to rebuild the boat while you're in the middle of the ocean. And I mean, there is no way we can, we can just burn the system down and start from scratch, but that, 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 that's not helping. Uh, you just have to do a little bits here and there and hope that somehow things get better. I mean, the most practical thing we are currently trying is, um, so what I've done for a while is I, I made people in the lab check each other's code and uh, look at the data and all of that. And that, that is good, but they're still friends in the lab and I don't know how, how, how deep it really goes. So now the idea is to team up with other labs who work in similar areas, but they have not worked on the same, they haven't worked on the same project and I, we, are, we are building a little reproducibility circle. And I say, listen, I have a paper which I want to send out and uh, we have to put all the code on GitHub and da da da. Um, how about you now go and try to download and check it and see how far you get with this. Uh, and what I do in, in return is when you have a paper, I do the same service for you. Um, would help with the reproducibility. It's not completely clear what you get, what you really get out of it. Um, maybe if it's a lot of work, you could say it's in the middle, of, middle uh, authorship maybe, but then people might be conflicted because they want to get by anyhow. So we need to sort out some of the details, but 
the, the practical steps I can think of are usually more on a smaller departmental or within group um, 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 size. I, I, maybe it's just my own limitation intellectually. I can't think in terms of Europe and whole countries and all of this. When it becomes um, a practical life of what can I and my friends and other people are interested, we're already excited about this, what, what can we do? And it's mostly teaming up and trying to, to work with each other's code and data and seeing how far we get. Thank you. Yeah, that's a really good, uh, good tip. Um, Renee, you mentioned earlier persistent identifiers. I wonder whether that's something that needs to be done systemically or if it's something that should be done on a small scale. No, it should be done uh, systematically and for all data and with a very fine granularity. The biggest problem for me is that uh, nowadays we still have the bad habit of only attributing persistent identifiers to data sets and you have to go uh, into the data set. If it is a matrix for every cell, uh, you have to uh, um, attribute an identifier and then you can really work with the data on a very granular level and assure that you can always uh, reach it at, uh, at any time later. No? Mm -hmm. I think this is the most important thing. Mm. Makes sense, thank you. Um, Alexia, you look like you're ready to add something. Yes, I was going actually to comment on, on Florian's as well, because I agree with him. Um, uh, the, the, the push, I think, has to first come from the PIs, from the head of departments, um, because if there is the push from that angle, then the rest of the researchers will try to incorporate these practices as part of their work. It is, of course, a problem because maybe there is not a specific established uh, protocol or, or policy. So there is lots of different bits at the moment and all seem to be saying more or less the same thing, but it's not one uh, resource, it's different resources. So maybe that also causes the problem. But I know even at the university, I mean, I, I am part of the uh, data champions group. That's already an effort. It's a focus group that is trying to promote uh, good practices in data um, across the whole university. And we have in these groups people from across different departments. So us helping each other in that way um, is already a good starting point. I think also another, and it's very important, this the other point that we need to tackle, and that can be tackled very quickly as well, is training and capacity building. Um, having the right training so people would want to know exactly okay so what do i need to do to be able to manage my data properly to be able to make it reproducible if there is no training on that how are people supposed to do it so i think the lack of training is also in a way a culprit of why we have the situation and uh, capacity building having enough trainers um to be able to teach this and you can see successful programs like the Carpentries. They started small lessons on, you know, how to do a small program so that you explore data, you know, and, and these have spread across the world and they are receiving funding and you have, uh, you know, trainers from the Carpentries all across the world now. So this can be done uh, using similar models and, and you achieve a big impact. Mm. Thank you. So there seems to be a, a theme emerging that these small scale changes often come from collaboration, whether it's checking is each other's reproducibility, whether it's using identifiers that enable you then to, to share information about data, or whether it's sort of training and networks, um, which is really interesting. And you mentioned data champions, which is, of course, across disciplines. And I feel we can't have gotten this far in the session about data management and reproducibility without talking about what's often the elephant in the room about disciplinary differences. And I think there can be a sense that these topics um, are often sort of spearheaded by STEM subjects, um, but actually we really need to consider the needs of arts, humanities and social sciences too. Um, so could we explore a little bit what other disciplines might need and what might be some of the specific things that we can do to improve in that area? If they're different at all, it might be that actually you feel um, the same approach should work across the board. Um, any thoughts? 
Rene, you look like you might uh, be ready to say something. Oh, we can't hear you, perhaps. Yes, no. Oh, but I, I'm just looking for a, a slide. <laughs> uh, I, I, there's one platform, you know, that psychologists created to share data that then was extended to, um, to all disciplines. I, I don't have the, uh, maybe some one of the participants um, has it at hand. It is, a, it is a website. So, and, and this site was created because psychologists saw that every project they had had something in common. There was always one step after the other. And they said, uh, it's, it, it works for uh, all of us. And, uh, and there are some disciplines where this works, but especially for the humanities, I think uh, one project differs so much from the other uh, that, that you really need uh, a description level uh, that explains the whole uh, uh, the project. And, uh, and even there, referencing as da uh, to data is, is even more important and even more complicated because uh, people from human humanities, they cite and they cite other people's that cite. So you have lots of chains. It is something like, uh, like these uh, blockchains. You, uh, you, you might need a blockchain approach to um, reproduce data from humanities or something similar, just to have an idea about uh, that. Maybe this is the only common approach for, for uh, humanities because they cite, they cite in, in chains. And um, th this is the biggest problem uh, from my point of view for humanities, the, the diversity of the approaches and uh, the lack of, uh, of standards because it's even not uh, foreseen uh, as something important, whereas in psychology, standards have a much bigger importance. Mm. And I will check for that slide. <laughs> I will mute and I check for... Thank you. Yeah, I, I remember talking to a humanities librarian about the issue of what reproducibility means in the humanities. And he mentioned perhaps this idea of citations being that version of reproducibility. Um, Leonard, I wonder from a European and a policy perspective whether you have anything to add. Well, this is a this is always a good question. I think the, the first step that we always try to do is to emphasize that we keep this discussion because it doesn't. Uh, there's also a lot of discussion always at the European level about the inclusion of social sciences and humanities in the research programs, and that is uh, it's always a challenge how they are framed in this context. Um, now. I, I think there are already things that are different in certain disciplines. So what we just said about, for example, the rewards and the commissions and some, some fields, it's not about papers, but it's about monographs or, or something else. And it's already a difference that exists and that kind of works for, for the different areas and more or less as well. And why not keep these kind of differences so that they fit, that, that they fit still to the domain or the discipline because we, we can't expect one size fits all solutions, even in a single uh, research institutions that might have a few thousand uh, research staff, different levels. Um, but I think some ideas that I, I think are from uh, that that underlie that, that that are kind of the foundation for for the research data management and reproducibility um, issue. They definitely still will probably resonate with with people all across the research. It is like the transparency and the Try to be trying to be more objective, even though that can also be um, challenged in certain different <laughs> disciplines, of course. So I, I think if you if you take those as kind of the, the the measures that we want to achieve, then it's that's for me that's um, that's okay. But if we say okay, RDM is the mechanism to be reproducible, which is good science, then of course that that would not work everywhere, and that's why we should um, not use this as like one single approach across the board for all the different um, fields that, that are probably concerned by this discussion. That, that's what I can say. It's a, it's a very challenging topic, of course, to, to think about standards for certain disciplines that don't even have a notion of data and that probably even criticize the datafication of their own fields and of the datafication of the management of universities and research. So there, there's a whole, rightly so in some in, in different ways, I think. So there's a, there's a whole lot to, to untangle before kind of trying to use one, one approach in, in that field or in different fields that are not really, um, yeah, uh, 
fit for this this type of, of kind of data driven or data like data minded approach. So my personal view on this. Thank you. Now you've highlighted some very key issues I suppose that we should be thinking about. Um, Alexia. Yeah, one, one, two things also while hearing uh, Lennart and Rene talk, I also, it came into my mind a few other points. Um, ethics. So I think this varies between the different fields. I, I know, for example, because I used to work before as a researcher in, on the clinical uh, campus. So what, you know, medical data, ethics for medical data are totally different um, from other data and in other fields. Maybe other fields are able to make their data open, you know, and publish it widely. But when it comes to health and medical records, these are normally kept under lock and key. So the ethics there, depending on the type of data you have, they will differ. So there's different policies and different ethics involved on, on, on the sensitivity, even storage. So, you know, you, you are not uh, able to store data in the same way um, you would um, with normal data. It has to be encrypted um, and stored in a safe environment, uh, whereas with other data you can easily put it, you know, in, another, in a normal server and process it, you know, and generate the results. So all these uh, differ. So it's, again, the whole life cycle depending on the data you have. And uh, apart from that, I feel many of the things, though, are similar. So, you know, if you think of the data life cycle, you would still need to do the different processes regarding uh, of which field, because data management and reproducibility are not field specific. They are uh, general fields. Um, but of course, what I think also differs is um, the type of data in the sense, not of the field, but the actual type. So is it text data? Is it uh, audio data or visual data. And I'm, I'm saying audio and visual because um, normally these are more associated with the arts uh, and humanities because they do interviews, uh, recording people. So a whole conversation that is in audio, some of it gets transcribed. So it's then transcribed to text. Some of it is, is a whole uh, video interview. Um, so then how do you store the data? It's, it, it has to be stored in a different way than you would store a normal table, you know, a, a very large table. Uh, and also the other point is the size of data. So um, this also tend to differ between the fields. Um, where I used to work with, we used to work with millions of records because we used to do um, sequencing data. So we have data um, from genomes, which is uh, terabytes <laughs> of data. I think Florian will know what I'm talking about and most probably he can tell you more about it. And, you know, it's different when you have maybe a few rows, 30 observations. So, you know, you have to treat it totally different. Where do I store the data? How do I store it? Do I add metadata? Metadata is also a, a very popular topic now. Um, and it differs by field. Some fields have already established metadata. We have, for example, in our field, EDAM and, and other ontologies, Go terms uh, that you use um, to, to annotate data and other databases. But other fields maybe are still lacking that. So there is no standard annotation of the data. So all this. I feel that's where it, 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 it differs in these specific bits. But otherwise, as a, as a, as a, as a process, uh, thinking of it in an abstract way, I think it is similar in all the fields. Thank you. Thank you. That's a really interesting perspective. And uh, Florian, anything to add? Yeah, well, I, well, I listened to this. I was thinking if the, um, the main difference is really field specific or if it is what people sometimes call qualitative versus quantitative research. I mean, as soon as you put things into numbers and you do statistics, at least in theory, it should be simple, uh, the whole reproducibility stuff. Um, when you have what people call qualitative research, which is um, for people having interviews, you, you're a political scientist and you, 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 
do an interview on regime change in Zimbabwe and you talk to five politicians there. I mean, the type of data, type of analysis you do is just very, very different. And um, I think there's much more resistance there. I mean, I don't know this personally because I'm a computational guy in cancer research. I just follow this because my wife is in political science. And when she talks to her colleagues, it seems all the ones who work on like statistics on big um, um, large data uh, comparisons, they are very, they understand the concepts or that at least they, they feel they have an access to it and they feel they, they're involved in the discussion. And the ones who spend their time thinking about what Hobbes would have said about Biden or what, what happens within these interviews, they're just like, I, I don't know, I don't think it concerns me. I think that it also just echoes what Leonard said, that there will be the executives, the people who think all of having data is already wrong for, for the kind of science they do. Thank you. Yeah, that's uh, that's a really good point. And I can see that there's a very um, lively discussion in the chat as well. And I'm sure we'll pick up on, on some of that when we write up a blog on this session. Um, I think we're coming up to the end of our time. So I would like to suggest that Sasha, perhaps you could share the poll that we've prepared for the audience. So everyone, you've listened to the speakers, we've explored a lot of aspects of reproducibility and data management. We've thought a bit about how they relate to one another and how both are really important. Some, someone said essential to science, uh, but we are gonna push you. If you could emphasize one aspect of both, um, what would you do? We'll give just a few more seconds for people to vote. Mm. Very interesting. I can see that um, one option is coming up quite strongly above the others. Um, okay. Shall we just end the polling? I hope you've had a chance to vote now. We're almost there, a few more people. I'm not sure if everyone is going to vote. <laughs> Thank you, Sasha. Fab. Okay, so let's share those. Um, as you can see, I think most people are persuaded that both are equally important and they should both emphasize perhaps in different ways. Um, some people tend towards data management, uh, even if we said at the beginning, it might be a little bit less exciting for people, I guess uh, there's a sense that it is important. Um, but um, yeah, so I think more or less a tie, but maybe data management getting slightly an edge on that. Um, thank you very much. I, um, so very interesting. I would like to invite the audience uh, or ask for one more favor of the audience. We have a feedback form on these sessions, which I hope Sasha will be able to uh, share the link to in the chat. It is literally just a couple of questions. It should take you only a minute or two to complete. That would really help us. Um, as I mentioned, we will write up a blog and we'll share a recording of this session if you haven't been able to catch all of it. Um, and there's two more events coming up tomorrow and on Friday. And again, the links will be in the chat. Um, many thanks to everyone for attending, but particularly thanks to our speakers, René Schneider, Alexia Cardona, Leonard Stoy, and Florian Markowitz uh, for being with us today and sharing your thoughts. Thank you very much, everybody. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>